Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jeremiah Dobrik. I'm the managing editor here at the Long Beach Post, uh, and welcome to the Post's debate featuring uh, candidates for Area 1 for the Long Beach Unified School District's Board of Education. Um, this is one of several debates we're hosting before the June 7th primary, uh, where some citywide races could be decided before the November 8th general election. So um, if you want to see more of these debates or uh, check out our Compare Your Candidates tool where you can see all the candidates and all the various races compared head to head. Check out our elections homepage, which is lbpost.com slash elections. Um, and co-hosting today's debate with me is Mike Gardabasio. Um, and over the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to be asking questions of the candidates for Area 1. Um, and they are Nubia Flores and Sharifa Batts. Uh, the, the third candidate in this race, uh, Maria Isabel Lopez, couldn't join us today, um, but you can see her, of course, in our Compare Your Candidates tool. Um, the seat they're competing for in this, this race covers most of the North Long Beach and Bixby Knowles area, um, and there's no incumbent in this race, so it's a, it's a wide open race. The way this is going to work today is uh, each candidate is going to have two minutes to do opening statements. Um, when uh, there will be a timer they can see that's counting down, I don't think the audience is going to be able to see that timer, but um, you guys will see it count down. Uh, you'll get a warning at 30 seconds, and we just ask that you wrap up uh, uh, at or before that timer reaches zero so we don't have to jump in and stop you. Um, then, of course, uh, you'll also have two minutes to answer each question. Um, so two minute opening statements, two minutes for each question, there will be a series of questions, two minutes for closing statements. Um, we're also going to allow some follow ups from the moderator. So if a moderator asks you a follow up question, you'll have another 30 seconds to kind of delve a little deeper on that follow up question. And if one of the candidates is directly attacked by the other candidate, we'll, we'll give space for a little 30 second uh, response as well. So to start, um, we're going to start with those two minute opening statements and we're going to start with uh, Nubia. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Nubia Flores, and I'm running for Long Beach Unified School Board to represent Area 1. I'm running to continue my advocacy and work for inclusion, representation, and access for all our students. I am a proud alum of public schools from elementary to college. I worked in communications for 10 years and have been working at a local nonprofit for the past two years as a parent organizer in our community. Overall, I come with 11 years of experience in parent advocacy and community organizing in our schools, having worked with parents and LBUSD leadership on initiatives like the inclusion resolution that set our standards for our schools, on including and representing students with disabilities, working with uh, LBU with community advocates to write the disability history resolution and being part of the team that helped write LBUSD's district-wide equity policy. I've worked alongside parents in PTA school site councils and at the district level, the community advisory committee where we advise on policy and on special education. At our city level, I serve on the Citizens Advisory Commission on Disabilities. I've been endorsed by the Teachers Association of Long Beach, the LA Federation of Labor, the Los Angeles County Democratic Party and other labor and local democratic organizations. I am one of the community members that has been part of the work that's been going on in our schools for the past two years, working with students during the pandemic and helping our school communities reopen. I worked in partnership with parents, schools, and community organizations to help support students with making sure they were connected so they could learn from home, teaching parents how to advocate for their students in a world that went completely completely virtual, and supporting teachers, helping them to connect with parents who didn't speak English. I bring all of this lived experience with me and look forward to serving as an elected member to the school board. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll go to Sharifa next. You have two minutes for opening statements. Okay, good morning. My name is Dr. Sharifa Batts, and I am grateful for this opportunity to speak today. So I was born in Long Beach. I've been married to my husband Cameron for over 27 years. And along with my mother Hattie Herring, we've been extremely active in the community. My husband and I were the proud parents of two daughters. Our oldest is a social worker and our youngest is recently crowned Mrs. Long Beach. Now both attended Long Beach schools, including Longfellow Hughes and both graduated from Long Beach Poly, where I was the PTSA president. I hosted teachers luncheons at both Poly and Hughes and helped many other positions. I was also the secretary of the Advanced Placement Collaborative, where I worked with Dr. Felton Williams to increase the number of students of color in AP and honors courses. The district did receive national recognition for this work, and this work also started the talks of equity 
in the district. Now I highlight these because the district's recent adoption of an equity policy is representative of my work and involvement in the district. I have four grandchildren who will start attending schools. So I wanna ensure that the work of the district to promote excellence and equity continues for all. So the three core issues I plan to focus on is back to in-person learning. I recently received my doctorate degree from Pepperdine. So I recognize the importance of in-person learning equity for all by providing access for every student based on their needs and safety for everyone. I currently serve as the president of Beta Pi Sigma Tau chapter here in Long Beach where our national motto is youth takes priority and I've completed numerous board leadership readiness certifications. Professionally, I'm the vice president of safety and environment at Ports America where keeping the workforce safe during COVID has been a priority. So in addition to over 20 years as a volunteer and advocate in the schools and Long Beach community, I have been actively preparing for this board role. Thank you. Great. Uh, those are wonderful opening statements. And I just want to thank, uh, echo Jeremiah's comments and thanking both you guys for being here. Um, I know uh, as, as a reporter and just as someone who's grown up in Long Beach, it's nice to get to see more forums where we can actually hear from the candidates. So thank you both for making the time to be here. Um, I am also born and raised in Long Beach um, for a hundred plus years. It's sort of been assumed that your kids hit school age in this city. They enroll in an LBUSD school. Mm -hmm. Um, and they do K through 12 in the district. Um, I think recently housing prices have something to do with this. A lot of things feed into this, but we certainly are seeing more competition. You see more parent groups um, advocating for charter schools or homeschooling um, and obviously declining enrollment uh, in part because of birth rate and in part because of these other issues is a real challenge that district faces. What do you think the district's role is in trying to retain more families uh, in putting their students into LBUSD schools versus choosing private schools or charter schools. Do you think that's something the district should be doing? And if so, what would your message be to you know keep kids in the district uh, versus going those other routes? And we'll start with uh, Sharifa. Great, thank you. So the affordable housing, it's definitely a part of the city's um, strategic plan. So the district, it must work with the city and other partners to develop specific and concrete strategies to provide affordable housing for the families and the teachers and the staff. Um, because of course, the lack of affordable housing, it makes it difficult for the young families, like you stated, to be able to afford and live within this city. So the district, we have to go over and beyond because we want our public schools, we are blessed to have the Long Beach Unified School District. It is a great, we've received national recognition um, as the best urban school, you know, um, in regards to the Advanced Placement Collaborative with our work that we did for the district. We need to continue to promote this message to our families and highlight all of the wins because charter schools, they only come into play when we are not paying our teachers well, or when there's issues within the actual school system. So by highlighting all the wins and by reaching out to the community and making sure that we have an involved community, partnering with the community, making sure that we have strong parent involvement, then keeping our public schools strong is the goal. And yes, it is something that the district should be focused on because as you stated, that's how the schools make their money through enrollment. So we have to keep our enrollment high in order to make sure that our budget is not negatively impacted. Because once the budget is impacted, that's when layoffs occur. That's when now you're, you're affecting the community, right? With layoffs and all the other negative stuff that comes along with it. I absolutely do agree that the district has a role. Um, in highlighting all that is available in our public schools. Um, public schools are the great equalizer. Um, I'm a first generation American. Um, when I started kindergarten, I didn't know English. Um, I, my parents were monolingual Spanish speakers. And to me, um, our neighborhood schools are for all students. Um, so now is the time to go all in on our public schools. It's an all hands on deck moment from parents to teachers, 
community organization and our, all of our elected representatives are, are needed to help support public school education. Um, as a board member, um, my role, what I would do is to, be, to do things on a citywide level to advocate for things like affordable housing, which is great, and a solid cost of living um, for our working families, because that is also impacting declining enrollment. Um, as a school board member of LBUSD, I would advocate for us to celebrate how our public schools are for every single student. Um, I have a son with disabilities and charter schools, private schools, Catholic schools, those are not for, my, for a child like mine. Um, every neighborhood school has to take every single student that lives in that neighborhood. Um, so we need to be able to highlight what is so great, what's wonderful about our public schools. We have great academic programs, there's the opportunity for students to socialize, there's sports opportunities, and there's the opportunity to educate and support our students um, for their life after school. So as LBOSD, I think um, it's their role to help promote all of that. Thank you both. Um, I think uh, actually a good uh, question to roll into from there uh, is actually one of the big challenges facing public schools right now. Um, and we'll start uh, with Nubia and then we'll go to Sharifa. But um, to start, um, I think the probably the one of the main things that's weighing on public school families right now is just how much of a hit uh, the pandemic was, distance learning and the learning loss that came with it. Um, there's a huge, um, it's a huge uphill battle now just for kids to get back to where they were. Um, wh what are, what, what should be done about that learning loss? Um, what are some things the district isn't doing already that need to be done to help try to bring kids back up to speed? And like I said, we'll start with Nubia and then Sharifa. Um, it's all connected. And just as we were talking previously, um, declining enrollment is having a big impact on our schools. And that is having a huge economic impact on our schools, um, specifically our Title I schools, which have uh, the majority of the student population or our students that are on lunch and um, on free or reduced lunch programs. Um, when we start to cut to see the, these budget implications, these are the students that are the most affected. So we want to make sure that we, we still have the supports in place to help them to succeed academically and that students and um, teachers have all that they need. Um, what we need to do, at, you know, in, ter in terms of like, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Oh my God, I'm totally. Well, that's okay. What, let me let me let me jump in and, yeah. and put it a little more concretely. So, what what's something the district uh, isn't doing that they could be doing um, to to help make up for that learning loss that every just about every student suffered during the pandemic? I think what it could do is do more of a target to to do to communicate more with the community how it is targeting um, our schools, doing targeted interventions for our most impacted. Um, we knew we know that our that those mostly impacted our black and brown students. Um, so I'm hoping that they are going through, or as they are saying, with an equity lens to see who were the most impacted, making sure that. Our students are receiving services like tutoring programs, that there will be an opportunity for summer enrichment programs, um, and that these are accessible to all students, um, especially in our schools. We've, we've seen the impact in our area one schools. Thank you, Sharifa. Uh, same question um, to you. So I'm the vice president of environment and safety down at the ports. And during the COVID crisis, I had to implement COVID protocols, be very well aligned with the state, local, federal guidelines. The next steps for Long Beach Unified School District is developing a more coherent response to the COVID situation that will allow the students to start experiencing some normalcy and provide equitable resources to start to chip into this academic achievement gap. Um, the most glaring gap is that 70% of African-Americans are failing English and math. So as you stated, this now goes beyond just the glaring gap of just African-Americans. You have all races that have been impacted due to the digital divide and having to learn online. Um, it, it was not the uh, easiest type of learning for 
a lot of individuals. So by closing this academic achievement gap, then you have current generations that are definitely gonna be better off. So first you have to share the vision of the student success. You have to go back to basics, go to grassroots. Let's start focusing on equity and excellence. You're gonna have to provide resources, mentorships. Um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna advocate for hiring more teachers that look like the students. When you think about similarity attraction theory, you tend to relate to people who look more like you. So advocating for more teachers um, and then doing training for cultural sensitivity. You have the black and brown students, they are going through a social and mental anguish after COVID, um, all students are, but they have cultural differences that need to be addressed and understood so that they can move forward to pursue excellence. Uh, you know, and actually we're gonna stick with the pandemic too a little bit. Uh, I, I wanna, and this will go to uh, Sharifa first, but. I wanted to, instead of looking forward, like we just did, I, I wanna look backward a little bit. Um, there was a whole lot of turmoil that went on. Every, every student in public school during this time went through something completely new. Um, and with hindsight, looking back 2020, um, obviously people made the best decisions they could at the time they had, they had then. But um, what's an instance during the pandemic uh, that you would have done something differently um, than what the school district staff recommended, recommended and, and the board executed. Can you give me an example of something you would have done differently and what you would have done? And Sharifa, go ahead, two minutes. Um, one of the things that I would have done differently is uh, partnering with various groups in the community immediately. Um, just as I had to do down at the docks, it's, it's a lot of what you're saying, it's that forward thinking. Um, it was unknown to everyone. The district did the best that they could when you deal with something that's unknown. But when you're partnering with other groups and having a strong collaboration with various, um, with various groups, right? Um, you are better, to, we're, the saying is we're better together, right? And so just like with the uh, Chromebooks, that was a great opportunity you know, 92% of the students, they were connected, but you still had that 8% gap with the digital divide where you have a small, even though it's a small portion, they were just still unable to connect. And that increased the academic achievement gap. Um, so being able to have mentors looking at tutor opportunities, you know, even though it's online, being able to still adhere to the protocols to be able to identify where the students are lacking and the attention that's being needed. So that forward thinking, you would have to put into place protocols to where they could still learn. You know, it, it was more of a reactive state that the district had to go through. We, and every time the policies changed, we had to deal with that down at the docks. You think you're doing one thing right, and then next week, all of a sudden, everything changed. So having a, a strict plan from the very start that people would have to adhere to, it would have helped the students be able to, yeah, it's a uncomfortable situation at first, but then where they can move forward in learning. You, and I, I, wanna, I wanna follow up a little bit because it sounds like you, in the, in the broad strokes, you think the district had to do, did, did what it had to do. Um, and there, but there obviously would have been some, you, you're just talking about more support for students, mentorship, that kind of thing. More, really you wish they had a little bit more um, clarity of what they could expect. I think everybody did. But do you think overall the district hit the right um, notes on uh, the major things like the timing of reopening, uh, masking and vaccines? The district did the best that they could. Um, because again, with the unknown, it's, this was something that was unknown to everyone. Um, when it came to masking, you have to adhere to the state and local and federal guidelines, which they did. And that's not going to make everybody happy. Um, you have some people who don't want to wear masks. You have other people where they want the students in person learning. And so I do feel the district did the best that they could, but there was what happened was that you were able to identify where there could have been better decisions made. Thank you. 
Um, and and Nubia, we'll go to you first with that 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 broad question. Um, uh, what um, what's an instance that you disagreed with how the district handled or could have done better um, during the pandemic shutdowns, uh, and what would you have done differently? Um, what they could I worked at one of the local nonprofits, um, and um, I as a parent organizer, and all my work was dedicated on doing one on one parent work. Um, what they could have done differently and what, what some schools, but not all schools across the district, because they left that up to each school site. I think they could have done, uh, given better direction on a school district wide level um, to, to set up tech tech teams to help students. There was a lot of troubleshooting that was needed um, just on how to connect students on their Chromebooks. There was, I mean, it, sh it just showed what a huge digital divide we have. We needed um, more language access support. We have a huge population of monolingual Spanish speaking and Khmer speaking parents. Um, it was very difficult. If you can imagine being like, your kids are at school, I mean, at home, you're you're kind of now taking on the role of teacher. How are you able to communicate with a teacher if you're not able to, if you're not speaking the same language? How are you supporting your student with their lessons if you don't speak the language that they're being taught in? Um, a lot of my work was done in that, in that kind of individualized family work. Um, but what I feel the district could have done is kind of implement more of a management strategy, strategy across the district to set up like, um, tech captains that where parents could go by on appointment basis to go, you know, get some direction and support on um, supporting their student at home. I also think communication could have been better. Not every single parent has an email or is plugged in through text. I think we need to figure out ways to communicate with all the parents in our community. Um, and one of the things that I saw at a school that I wish had been implemented wide was when it was time to sign up your child for testing, a school set up, morning, during, and evening hours for parents to come in by appointment and sign and get support signing them up. Um, sorry. Thank you. And I, I, again, just to follow up a little bit more, um, you both addressed the, the, the closing period, which is what I asked during that first two minutes, but I'll, I'm curious too about, did you think they followed good protocols? I know a lot was set by the state, but um, in the broad strokes of how they enforced masking, um, how they encouraged vaccines, um, would you have done something differently or do you think the district hit the right strokes or the right uh, notes that they had to at that point? Now, I also agree. I think that they did the best that they could and also they're following state and um, state mandates and our local um, health department mandates. What I think could have been done differently is just better communication, um, transparency. Um, it sometimes felt as I'm an LBUSD parent myself. Um, it seems like sometimes our communication, it doesn't come as fast as it should. So where we're opening schools, I wish that they had done more earlier on rather than the week before school to have those protocols be clear. Thank you. I'm gonna throw it to, to Mike for the next question. Next few questions actually. Okay, and we're gonna go with this question. We're gonna go with Nubia first and then Sharifa. Um, you know, this has been a, a nationwide and a statewide education story that um, Jeremiah discussed learning loss, but there's also been an issue kind of realigning students to the basic discipline and like school day structure, um, you know, coming back from the pandemic where there was, uh, uh, everyone was in different circumstances during that. And I'm curious for, I've heard reports uh, from teachers and administrators at several high schools of you know discipline issues on campus and school is sort of struggling to get everyone back in the flow of things. Um, I'm curious for what you as a school board member would encourage the school district, how would you encourage them to provide guidance on how to um, move forward in terms of those issues? Uh, and like I said, we'll start with Nubia first. For starters, I think that we really, you know, we talk a lot about this and you hear this a lot in the school board about how we have restorative justice programs um, in our public schools right now. What I hope, um, what I would hope to do and to advocate as a school board member is to make sure that everyone has an understanding of from 
the from the administration to the teachers how to implement these restorative justice programs as as well as what this looks like on the parent side like if a parent hears from a child that their daughter or son are being bullied like what is the policy on bullying? How do you address that? I think that we need to be able to define the process and protocols and what restorative justice looks like. I also think, um, and I would advocate as a school board member, um, for the hiring of more school counselors and allowing counselors to actually counsel. What I saw a lot in my work in the community is that for many families, school counselors are the first Con point of contact for someone that is a mental health professional. Um, so I think that we need to really, and I would advocate that as a school board member, advocating for more the hiring of school counselors and also allowing for school counselors to be able to implement these um, things that we talk about, like social and emotional uh, wellness programs in our schools. Um, I also would look at schools, especially in my area that I look to represent, um, what does discipline look like at these schools? Again, advocating for a targeted intervention and look and mean and advocating for services towards these schools. Um, just as a follow up on the the on, on what you're saying, it sounds like you know there's sort of I hear an education group sometimes kind of a maybe a false dichotomy of like more more restorative justice versus more suspensions or something. What you're saying is you think that going with a mental health first counselor approach, you think kind of is a, a different option um, to where maybe you're taking care of some of those issues on campus, but without having to increase suspensions. Do I, is that roughly yes, correct? I, yeah, I think um, we need to look at where this behavior is coming from and looking at the whole student, the whole child. Um, what, is, what is the reason for the behavior? Um, and given what the students have gone through, what no generation in America has gone through, what no public school, um, school has gone through since the Great Depression, um, we need to look through this through an equity, uh, through a lens of equity and mental health. Okay, and then Sharifa, we'll go back to that first broader question for you on discipline on campuses um, coming back from the pandemic and kind of the approach that you would advocate, advocate for. Okay, so to start, we have to have very transparent communication on the different types of discipline. Um, because as it stands now, you know, we can look at data, all kids are not disciplined the same. And so we have to definitely look at it through an equitable lens um, and be a huge advocate for accountability. And accountability looks different across the board. So we have to, one, hold students accountable. We have to hold parents accountable. And we have to increase parent involvement. Research shows that when you have involved parents, then you have more successful students. They're more successful academically. They tend to be in, um, not as disciplined, you know, because you have the connection and the engagement, not only with the student, but you have student-parent engagement. You have parent-teacher engagement. You have teacher-student engagement. It's a triangle that is complete at that point. Um, being an advocate for the social-emotional learning. After COVID, we're starting to see various ramifications. Um, you're seeing students who are uh, being misdiagnosed, they're being mislabeled, and all because they may not necessarily understand an assignment, right? So what happens when a child, all of a sudden, they don't understand something, now they're labeled as, you know, they're a disturbance because they're playing on their phone or they're you know, talking to the students when the teacher is still trying to teach. So we have to go in with just being transparent, identify where the concerns are, identify, it doesn't matter if you're black, you're brown, Caucasian, what does it mean? What is discipline? You know, at what point do you discipline? You know, um, in, you know institute the discipline. So um, so it sounds like, you know, Nubi had mentioned the counselors, it sounds like your plan is, you know, more parental activation, right? And, and I know that you've both done work with parent groups and, and been a part of parent groups. So Sharifa, what, what specifically, how do you do that, right? That's something I hear a lot from teachers and, and coaches across the city is everyone would love parents to be more involved um, most of the time, right? Um, what, what would your plan be for kind of activating uh, parents in those situations where there's, uh, you know, discipline issues or, or what have you? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a critic, community engagement is critical, right? And you have to have the buy-in and the involvement of the parents. So hosting, you know, uh, like they just recently had the Black Student Achievement um, Initiative Symposium, where you had a lot of African-American parents who were there. You had the board members who were there, the teachers. You have to host events like this as an educational moment, right? And once you get the buy-in, that's where that engagement piece comes in. Hosting, you know, coffees, um, just different lunch and learns. You have to get the parents out. Our teachers are overworked. Our teachers have been stressed. And a lot of times the parents are sending children to school and it's now the teacher's problem. No, parents are held, need to be held accountable too. And so that's where bringing them to the table making sure that they understand their voices are being heard and that we we need them to be engaged. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Nubi, do you have a response to that? How do you do parent involvement in LBUSD? You invite them in. Um, our schools have just reopened um, for our parent volunteers, and every school right now is very different. Some schools are allowing it and some are not. Um, we Black Student Achievement Symposium came from two years of Black parents advocating for this and working for this. And one of the things they're advocating for is that the school district invite parents in and do a targeted approach. Um, part of that means inviting parents in and making sure that they're going to be welcomed. A small group of parents at a school can be transformative for a school community. Okay. My uh, last question for me, um, I don't know if Jeremiah's got more after that, but a uh, bigger picture question, and I'll, I'll probably ask a follow-up to each of you. Um, we'll start with uh, Sharifa and then Nubia. Um, you know, I've been watching the school board meetings. That's what I, I do for the post. There's obviously been um, a long-term declining enrollment trend. We discussed in sort of that first question, the effect that that's gonna have on the budget. The school district is the city's largest employer, in addition to the important role that it serves um, educationally and, and culturally here. Um, so my question to you is, with the likelihood, according to the district's you know, chief business officer, that those enrollment, that enrollment decline is going to continue, that budget cuts are going to come, that there is a possibility in future years of um, layoffs or, or cutbacks that people really feel and see. Um, how would you suggest that the district navigate those financial waters? Do you have a personal stake on cut should come X percent from teachers slash staff versus um, administrators in the district office? Is it program, like what programs do you prioritize protecting? How do you look at that knowing that if either of you is elected, this is likely something that's gonna come up in the future years? Um, Sharifa, we'll start with you. Looking at the most glaring gap is the academic achievement gap. Um, that's where you're definitely going to have to prioritize your money. You need to have a strong, stable educational foundation. And so you're going to have to keep your um, some of the budget within the academic programs. Okay, so that's, that's not going to be the first place where the cuts would come from. Um, what you some of the options you're gonna have to look into is shifting people right, maybe in the temporary position, because uh, you definitely want to avoid layoffs if possible. But to assess the priorities of the district, it's reading, writing, math, science, you know, and everything else has to be reassessed. But the for our goal to keep our students um, ready for the next level, which is we have to prepare them to transition into work or into college. We cannot impact, especially after COVID and the academic gap that has now increased for all, we have to be able to keep our money focused on academic programs. Okay, and actually Nubia, why don't we go to you and then I'll ask a follow-up uh, full question to both of you. I would, Definitely advocating, I would advocate for us to look at the overall budget and really 
just streamline where we can. I definitely would advocate for prioritizing our academic programs and making sure that anything in the classroom is not impacted, that it doesn't impact our students and teachers. Um, I, we have a lot of services and programs in our district and that anything that we can lean on, you know, whether it's from our city, community organization, neighborhood associations that we can lean on them to come in and supplement things that we can cut out from our budget um, so that we don't sacrifice um, services in our classroom and our academic programs. And just considering the fact that right now over the pandemic, and we're still trying to work back from this, is that you know, the state, and we hear about this on the national level, there's a, there's a shortage of teachers. Uh, uh, also, AIDS, my own son was impacted for this. My son lost two months of school because there wasn't an aid. Um, also, counselors. Um, there is what they're calling a labor shortage. So, to me, I would see is just that looking at the overall budget, seeing what are those the extra programs that we can do to make sure that it doesn't impact a student's academic success. Okay, I appreciate uh, appreciate those answers. Um, I have one other kind of big picture question, and then unless Jeremiah has a, another question, um, after this question, we'll go to your closing statements. Um, you know, education is, and public education especially, is in a, just an enormous position of uh, a period of transition, right? Um, there's so many sort of old school, new school ways of thinking. I think if you walk around any campus and talk to 10 different teachers, you're getting kind of 10 different answers about what the best approach is with kids. Um, and that's challenging, I'm sure, from a leadership position, but also kind of exciting that there's so many different ways of thinking out there. My question is, I, I see a little bit of a divide on, in talking to teachers, some of it's maybe generational on some teachers feeling like the district is becoming too data driven versus sort of the listening to teachers or more anecdotal about what teachers are going through. And my question to you guys is, how would you sort of approach teachers? If, if a teacher comes to you and says, hey, I don't feel like I'm being included in the decision making process in this school district, um, what's your answer to them? And, and how would you plan on maybe interacting with teachers differently or or not differently, I guess, than what the district is currently doing. Nubia, we'll, uh, we'll start with you and then finish with Shree. I'd say that the first part, the reason that we are so, or what it seems like, especially over the past two years, I've also watched every single district school board meeting, um, is that it's data driven because we are trying to assess where our students are at. And we've been doing a lot of work around equity. So in order to be able to address these needs um, on an from an equitable place, we need to see where students are at um, and meet them where they are. Um, I would take that really seriously. I heard from our, I think it was two school board meetings ago, where teachers said that they've had enough of all the extra programs and the trainings. Um, we need to take this seriously. Then we need to have serious conversations with our teachers. We, this is something that I have done um, and that I believe in as a community organizer is to be able to have these community spaces where we have these discussions. We need to be real about this. Um, over the past two years, we've had um, discussion around about equity programs, bias training, and so on, then let's hear from teachers what will work for them. Um, I think that if they are, we need, if they're saying that they want to have more of a voice, then we need to, as a school board member, I would advocate for a pathway for that to have their say um, in our programs um, and just how we run our schools. Sharif, the same question. Teacher and staff input is critical. Um, you know, so visiting all of the schools in the district um, and speaking with them about their thoughts specific to how we can improve opportunities for students, um, hosting Zoom sessions, outreach sessions, listening to them on the, the board when they come to speak at the um, boardroom meetings. But outside of that, some people don't feel comfortable coming to speak at the boardroom meetings. Um, sometimes there's a lot of politics. They don't, they don't wanna be the one lamb that stands out. You know, so having and creating a space, one, for teachers to come to, or having um, what I did when I was the PTSA president, we had little comment cards. 
right? And so we would collect the cards so that they could be anonymous even. Some people, they don't want their name, uh, you know, tied to a complaint. And so having an anonymous um, avenue for teachers to be able to voice their concerns, voice their opinions, um, and then the board actually taking all of this information. You go to certain schools where best practices, where people are raving, where they have positivity going on. Go and assess what, what are they doing right? And then sharing the best practices where you find a lot of the negative comments coming in. Because when you can do the key learnings and share best practices, that's again, where you're better together. And you can change the culture at the other schools where maybe the teachers are not feeling like their voices are heard. And then you have to act. Once you identify where there's concerns, you have to do something about it because that's when teachers feel as if their voices are heard. Thank you both. Um, I think that's our last question. We're gonna, uh, we'll do closings uh, two minutes each and we'll uh, start with Sharifa. Great. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I strongly believe in equitable opportunities and pursuing excellence. So as an All-American athlete who completed it in the Olympic trials, I'm a team player and I will bring a high level of commitment and discipline and include everyone. So with the Advanced Basement Collaborative, we were a group of volunteers who committed three years of work with students, parents, and teachers, and successfully increased the numbers of students of color from 500 to over 3,000 in taking AP and honors courses. So this type of collaboration is needed in order to continue to address the glaring academic achievement gap among the students and increase parent involvement. Now, some of my strengths are in risk mitigation and resiliency planning, which will be needed as safety concerns and more ramifications from COVID are identified. With over 15 years of experience overseeing safety within port locations across the US, my skills can help to develop more sound safety protocols for students, teachers, and staff as I created many of the safety guidelines, including the COVID-19 protocols to keep all longshoremen safe during COVID. Now with my doctorate from Pepperdine University that focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion on boards and completing three board leadership readiness certifications, my knowledge and abilities specific to board governance, budgets, and strategic planning through a board's lens are robust. So these skills will be needed when it comes to um, the lower than expected attendance and declining enrollment that we discussed, and we may experience the budgetary challenges in the near future. So I'm excited. I have multiple endorsements from the Los Angeles African American PAC group, the National Women's of Political Caucus. Um, I have the Southwest Carpenters Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nubia, go ahead, two minutes. Thank you for this opportunity today to talk to voters. As an elected school board member, I will work to make sure our schools have the support they need for our students and teachers in order to continue to center health and safety and that our schools continue to receive what they need to help our students recover for what they've been through these past two years. I wanna make sure every student has access to a quality education. I wanna make sure we have the appropriate language access for all who need it. And I will continue my advocacy to ensure that students with disabilities have the opportunity for a quality education. As I mentioned before, I am proud to have the endorsement of the Teachers Association of Long Beach Taub, which represents 3,700 members that include classroom teachers, nurses, librarians, speech therapists, and school counselors. No, I'm not a teacher myself, but what I am and have been is a fierce advocate for public school education and a community organizer working to educate and empower parents and education stakeholders to become involved in our schools and at our school district level to help advocate for all of our students. I'm proud and thankful to have been entrusted with this endorsement from Taub, our public school educators, because I've been, worked with both teachers and parents and the common core value that aligns us is that we are all student centered. And this pandemic demonstrated how much we rely on our schools to educate our children, feed our children, socialize our children and keep our kids safe. Now is the time to elect a leader like myself that will be an advocate for our students, teachers, and all the staff that support our students and keep our schools running. I want to be the next school board member and I wanna proudly advocate and 
represent area one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much for joining us um, for uh, it, this is such an important race that we didn't want to get let it get lost um, leading up to uh, primary day. And just a reminder for anybody watching, mail in ballots are already arriving in Long Beach. You can start voting now. Um, and this is this is a three person race. But it, if any candidate gets over 50 percent of the vote, um, this race is over. So June 7th could be the June 7th primary could be the end of this race or it'll go on till uh, November 8th. So. Um, as you're keeping up with election coverage, please visit longbeachpost or lbpost.com slash elections, lbpost.com slash elections. Um, one of these days, I'll be able to say my own website. Um, but <laughs> thank you again for joining us uh, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thanks, guys.